Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're new here because one or two of the things I've done recently may have attracted one or two new subscribers. If you are new here then this is basically part of my monthly series of videos where I do a recap of stuff I've done during the month. Um, there's always a blog post to go with it as well where I go into even more detail about these things so go and read that as well and sometimes as in this case there are one or two blog posts about specific things I've done where I go into even more depth. So yeah, if you look in the description, there's links to all the relevant posts and other links that you may find useful. As always, I'm not sponsored or gifted um, by anyone who is featured here. Um, you know, I've not been asked to do videos like this. I've not been asked to mention anybody particularly. Um, these are all my own opinions, that kind of thing. So yeah, basically there's a lot to cover this month. In particular, I've had my first TV appearance and my first appearance on British Radio as well. I've been to a trade exhibition where I've supported a charity there and I've been to a museum exhibition as well. In fact, I've done a whole course on ancient Greece this month, as you'll find out. And there's been various Blu-rays and TV shows I've been enjoying as well. So there's quite a bit to cover, quite a bit to get through. So I'm just going to crack straight on with it and I hope you enjoy it. So I'll start off with my media appearances, as that seems the obvious thing to mention as it's been the big news this month and the big surprise for me this month. I was on TV on the 2nd of December, which I know is slightly cheating for a November video, but it's all to do with events in November and it seems a shame to wait a whole month to talk about this. And then I had my first appearance on British radio towards the end of November. Not first appearance on radio or podcast in general. I've done one or two things before, but certainly on British radio, this was a big deal for me as it was my first time. So it's all relating to Scope's Big Hack project, basically. Uh, the Big Hack is a website giving businesses advice on how to make their websites and apps and self-service technology like self-service checkouts accessible for disabled people. So there's lots of advice on there for them to do that, and the sort of things they can change and how they can change it and why it's important to change it. And there's contributions from bloggers like myself about the assistive technology that we use. So they've taken a post from my blog about how I use my iPhone, for instance, and there's going to be another post from me at some time in the new year, hopefully. And so, yeah, it's a great resource. It's very, very comprehensive. And in conjunction with that, they've done a survey showing that disabled people really do struggle still with all this kind of technology. And if they can't use a website or an app, something like that, then 50% of disabled people won't buy the item at all and 48% will go to a competitor instead. And people could pick one or two options or three options if they wanted to. So, you know, these would be multiple people, but the upshot is basically that they'll go somewhere else and not shop at the business that they were at. This is a big deal because there are 13.9 million disabled people in the UK with a spending power of an estimated £274 billion pounds a year. So that's a huge market. So it's, it's in businesses' interests to get us involved. And I was kind of the case study in this particular instance. You know, Scope included me in their press release. They had a few quotes from me as I'd spoken to a lovely lady called Laura Burnip on the phone who became my kind of media officer, media handler, if you like. She looked after me from that point on because a few news organisations did get in touch. So the first to get in touch was the BBC. So I went up to BBC Broadcasting House to record an interview for a radio show. And I was interviewed by the technology correspondent, Rory Catherine Jones, who a lot of you in the UK will undoubtedly know. He has experience of disability himself, of course, because he has Parkinson's and he's been very open about that, which is fantastic. He's helped to raise great awareness about that. And it was fantastic to meet him. He was lovely. He was really friendly. So I went along to BBC Broadcasting House with Laura Burnip, as I said, the media officer from Scope, and also James Taylor, the head of policy at Scope. So basically, Rory interviewed myself and James. He talked to me first about my experiences of using you know, city technology and the struggles I have accessing websites. So you know, I'm talking about things like poor contrast of text, red on black or grey on white, things like that that make it hard to read or there's apps that fix their text size, so I can't adjust the text size using the assistive options on my phone or my Mac or whatever. It just keeps it fixed at a small size. Visually impaired people really struggle when there are no image descriptions. So all these kind of things I mentioned. And it's quite easy talking about it because it's something I'm passionate about, it's something I know about. So I felt very comfortable doing it. And then James Taylor went on to talk about the big hack project itself and to promote that. So that went really well. Um, I was still a bit nervous listening to myself back afterwards, but it came out really, really well. You know, they edited it down really nicely, kept all the important points in and it is available on the website on BBC website and on podcast apps as well there'll be a link to this in the description below the program is called Tech Tent it's a weekly program about technology the main headline story was about the girl on the TikTok app the girl who was doing the video about her eyelashes and then kind of turned it around to talk about you know the troubles in China and things so if you search for the TikTok episode from the 29th of November on your podcast app you might be able to find that for Tech Tent but if you go onto the BBC website it's there as well you'll need a free BBC Sounds account to listen to that but that's easy enough to set up. So that was that. Sky also got in touch saying they wanted to do an interview. It was going to be live on their breakfast show in the morning. It was going to be a Skype call. Um, so I got up early to do it and then found out later that they'd cancelled it without telling me. So that wasn't very helpful and Scope weren't very happy about that. 
But Five News also got in touch. Now, they also had to cancel their interview on the day they wanted to do it originally, but they were very keen to have us because they like doing disability stories. They're very supportive of this kind of thing. So they invited us in on the 2nd of December instead. So we went along to the ITN production studios and it was so nice to us. They just stuck with us all the time. There was one lady who looked after us throughout from the moment we arrived to the moment we left. And there was a couple of other guests as well that we spoke to. And then there was a makeup lady next door that we went to just to have ourselves touched up a bit. And then, yeah, we went into the studio to do the interview. Now, actually, I'd been into the studio slightly earlier because when we first arrived at the studio they took me in there to check what the lighting would be like because they had asked if I had any access needs so you know I forewarned them that the brightness might affect me because I'm a bit oversensitive to that so they took me in there put the lighting up to the level it would be and you know sat me down and I was able to just make sure that it was fine so yeah we went into the studio later then for our, our interview obviously they brought us in when a video report was playing and then yeah we were introduced and went ahead with the interview and again just like the interview I did with Rory it was really easy you know it was the first time I've been on live tv but the thing is I didn't feel like I was on live TV. That's the thing. Cause there's no audience in front of me. All I've got is this lovely journalist lady in front of me who's really friendly like everyone else at Five News. She was interested in what I have to say because that's her job. But I also felt she was taking a genuine interest as well. I was just made to feel very comfortable. And again, because it's something I know about, it was easy to talk about. And I was with Chrissy Barrick from Scope this time. She's the digital influencer at Scope. So she was really lovely as well. She did a fantastic performance. We were quite a good team, the two of us. It really did gel together nicely. And the other advantage of being on live TV of course is that there's no editing you know you can say what you want and make sure you get your points across because you're not being cut out so you have more control so yeah it was a really great experience I was nervous going into these things of course but everyone was just so nice everyone from Scope was wonderful Laura and James and Chrissy were just amazing as were Bernie and Daisy from Scope as well who I spoke to on the phone while all these things were being arranged or communicated via email with so thank you to everyone at Scope for the support because if you hadn't been there for me I would never have done that on my own and thank you to the BBC and Five News as well well, you were also brilliant. And there's also a video of the Five News broadcast as well on their Twitter and Facebook pages. Initially, they uploaded an automatic video of the report on Twitter, and then they uploaded a captioned version later on Facebook and Twitter. It would be daft to have a video about accessibility but not have it captioned. So thank you to Five for doing that. That was brilliant. So yeah, I'll put the links in the description to that, and you can go and watch it. And I've done a long blog post about all this as well, talking about the campaign and the myths and misconceptions that cause businesses not to make things accessible and the issues that affect me and my media experiences as well. So there's a lot of detail in there. I've divided it up into sections if you want to read it a bit at a time. And I just hope you enjoy finding out more about it. It's been great to be able to share it with you like this. And the other thing that's consumed a lot of my time this month is a course about the Parthenon in ancient Greece. A lady called Dr Ellen Adams at King's College London put together a course for visually impaired people as part of her research to find out how we get on with audio description and touch description and things like that. So we've had a couple of sessions at King's College where we've learned about the history of the Parthenon and you know, how it fitted into ancient Greece, how it was designed and constructed and things like that. And we felt a model of the Parthenon we could handle and a model of the Athena statue that's in the Parthenon as well. And we had some tactile images to feel the building too. Plus we had audio description of a couple of paintings that feature the Parthenon, either from the outside or looking at it inside as well, looking at the frieze inside with all the sculptures. They were described in great detail for us by a lady called Carly Allen. That was fantastic. Not only did we have photocopies of the paintings, we also had tactile images as well that kind of gave us simplified views of the paintings and helped us to pick out key elements and things like that. We also went to the Parthenon Gallery and the British Museum as well because Fiona Slater, their Equality and Diversity Officer, has been involved with this too. So there's one room in that Parthenon Gallery where you can actually touch things. There's like a cast model replica of part of the frieze that went around the Parthenon at the top, kind of all these different sculptures of people on horses and other people that were around at the time represented in this kind of story as it were so you can get up close and feel these things and again there's a model of the parthenon you can feel there and then some original stone you can feel as well and then most recently we went to the british museum one more time to handle some genuine antiques from ancient greece dating back to like the fifth and sixth centuries bc which have been very well preserved and we had to be very careful of course so it was great to kind of get hands on with that kind of thing so that felt really special and really good and yeah just the whole course has just been really interesting and indeed because i did that course i actually took a weekend out to go to the parthenon gallery myself as well to look around the big main gallery we did do a little bit in there with Ellen but I took the time to actually spend a day just having a look around the whole gallery now I understood what I was looking at because you know, the panels on the wall were hard for me to read so at least now I had some idea because of this course of what was going on I also picked up the audio descriptive guide from the information desk because there are a few items in here where you can type in the number 
and listen to an audio described version of it. There's also a normal audio guide, which again you can type object numbers into, and I think you hear things from like the creators of the exhibition, just general commentaries rather than descriptions as such. Unfortunately, they're not available on the audio descriptive guide, so some of the numbers then don't work. It's only the ones that have like the audio description symbol. It'd be nice if it was all just combined in one device, because I still like to hear the commentaries for the other things as well. But, you know, the audio descriptive things they picked out were some of the most kind of interesting and important items in the whole Parthenon gallery. So it's still worth, you know, getting the uh, guide for that. So, yeah, just that in combination with the course, it just gave me a really nicely rounded view of the Parthenon. And then another exhibition I went to wasn't a museum exhibition, but it was a trade exhibition. So I went to the Site Village event uh, held by Queen Alexandra College every year. They do it a few times all over the country, um, but the London event is obviously the easiest one for me to get to. They do one in Birmingham as well, and occasionally they do one or two others too. And basically, Site Village is where companies and organisations showcase the latest technology, products and services that they have available for the visually impaired. So you've got people like the RNIB there and Amazon showcasing their Echo devices and there's various CCTV companies, there's travel companies, there's companies like Metro Blind Sports, there's people that can help you get into employment or just help you meet other people with perhaps similar rare conditions to your own. There's all sorts going on there. It's really good, it's really comprehensive. I wasn't there as a consumer this time though, I was actually on one of the stands um, it's a two-day event and I was there for one day helping out on the Vocalize stand. Now, Vocalize I've mentioned many times before. Um, basically, they're the company that provide audio description for theatre shows and museum tours and things like that. There are one or two other companies around the country that do that, but Vocalize do a lot in London and also elsewhere in the country too. So I've used them a lot. I'm really you know, happy to promote them. I'm also on their focus group as well. So you know they do know me pretty well. So I was happy to go along for a day. We had quite a lot of interest. Um, there were various people who uh, did know about vocalized services and had used them and, you know, were very happy with it. And there were people who didn't know about it as well who were keen to learn about it and sign up to the mailing list and things. So it was very, very worthwhile. I was glad to be able to talk about my experiences going to theatre shows and museums and things. And it was great to talk to Charlie Morris, who was on the stand with me as well, who was working for Vocalize at the time. She's now moved on to other things. I hope she does well in her next uh, venture. But also right next to us was my old school, funnily enough, the WESC Foundation, as it is now known. It's, it was very different back in the day when I was there in some respects. But a uh, member of staff who was there, uh, Richard Ellis, is someone I know very, very well from my time when I was there. And yeah, it was great to chat to him, to have a good catch up with him during the day. So talking to him and Charlie and everyone else, I just get busy all day, really. Um, I did take some time out to have a little wander around the exhibition as well after lunch, just to have a little break. Um, there wasn't anything there for me particularly, but you know I did speak to some very nice people too. And I've done a comprehensive blog post all about Site Village. I'll link to it in the description. I've listed all the exhibitors in there, including the few that I visited specifically. Um, so go and check that out. You can see the whole list of uh, companies and organisations that were there in case you want to find out what Site Village was about. But yeah, it was a very enjoyable day. I'm very glad I went along to that. And then talking about Vocalize, that's a good opportunity to mention the Illuminated River project that I also had a look at during the month. And basically, this is a huge art project where you're going to have 15 bridges along the Thames all lit up in various different ways. Not big flashing lights and stuff, much more subtle lighting, you know, changes in patterns and colours and things. And Vocalize have provided audio description tracks for the first four bridges that have been lit up. So you've got the Millennium Bridge, Southwark Bridge, Cannon Street Bridge and London Bridge. They're all lit up at the moment at night. And they look really, really lovely. And the audio description tracks are great as well because they describe the bridges to you, tell you a little bit about their history, and you also get to hear about the lighting itself and what it's doing. And there's also some music underlaying it as well that's been specially composed for this. So it's really good. It's really impressive. It's always nice walking along the South Bank anyway. But now this is an extra kind of visual to light to go with it. So I highly recommend going down there if you can. And I've done a video of all four bridges as well. So you can see kind of the lighting effect that's on there. And it'll be interesting to see what the other bridges are like as their lighting is activated. I'm looking forward to that. So then my big binge watch for the month has been Monty Python's Flying Circus, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And to mark the occasion, Network, famous for doing lots of great remastering jobs on various shows, have completely remastered Monty Python. This is something they've been working on for about 10 years with the Monty Python team kind of on the choir. Thankfully, Monty Python kind of kept the tapes because the BBC were going to wipe them originally. So they've used all the original tapes as far as possible to restore everything into HD. And it's such an improvement over the original DVDs and the TV. TV shows I can't begin to tell you it looks so much cleaner the colors are so much better it just all looks great they've really done a lot of hard work on it so yeah it's been really great to watch them like that again on blu-ray 
And they're also uncut as well. So various bits that were cut out have now been put back in. For instance, I think the most famous example is from the summarising proof competition where one of the contestants gave his hobbies as strangling animals, golf and masturbating. And the BBC insisted masturbating be cut out. Apparently it's okay to say you're strangling animals, but masturbating, no. That led to some very clunky edits over the years when it was cut out in one way or another. So yeah, that's been restored along with other things. Network have also included various bits cut from the kind of tapes from the studio filming and location filming. So you get to see outtakes and bloopers and alternate takes and extended sketches, all this kind of thing. Then there's other extras like rare interviews footage and a look at the restoration with Terry Gilliam. There's also some corporate films that the Pythons have made for a company like Bird's Eye which are really interesting and they're really funny too. And even on each episode there's a little hidden extra as well. There's only like one or two episodes where it doesn't appear but for the vast majority of episodes when you start it you'll notice that the episode starts on chapter two at least 30 seconds in rather than at the zero mark on chapter one. And the reason they've done that is because if you hit the back button on your remote and skip back a chapter when you start the episode you see the studio countdown clock that starts the recording and you hear the floor manager doing the countdown, you hear a kind of tone between like 20 and 10 seconds a lot of the time, it's all part of the kind of sound setup and things, and then you kind of get the final countdown from 10 to 1. So that's kind of a nice nerdy thing to have, it's nice of network to include those, and occasionally there's a little bit of banter and laughter in there as well, so it's kind of worth looking at them, just out of curiosity really. So yeah, it's a very nicely packaged kind of collection, all of that, and yeah, it's a nice selection of extras which are unique to this collection. If you've had other Monty Python box sets with extras on, they won't have been replicated here. So you might want to just keep them for the extras, even if you don't watch the shows anymore. In the box itself, you also get a book for each series too. So it's a really, really detailed, comprehensive book about how the series was made, telling you who was in every episode, how every sketch was done. I haven't read them all in detail because being visually impaired, it's just too difficult. It's too much to go through. But for diehard Python fans, they will love that. And then the whole thing is presented in this big cube-shaped box, which is called an exploding box in Python terminology, as they called it. It's called the Norwegian Blu-ray edition, the whole box, in fact. And if you know Monty Python, you'll know where that reference has come from. But yeah, basically the lid is holding down the sides of the cube. So when you take the lid off, the sides of the cube all fall down to reveal the discs inside and the artwork from Terry Gilliam on the inside. It looks really, really impressive. And the discs are housed really nicely. Some people have said that the box has been a bit damaged in transit. And I can kind of see why that's happened because of the cardboard in there. But thankfully mine was intact but yeah just the overall design i think it is quite nice you know, it's a little bit awkward shutting the box up again trying to you know get the sides back up and put the lid back on but that's fine so i've enjoyed watching all of that i've also been enjoying watching everything else python related in my collection as well so i thought well, i've just been to watch the lot because some of these things i haven't seen for ages so i've been through all the films i think if i had to pick a favorite out of the films it would probably have to be life of brian i think it is fantastic that film i've also enjoyed watching uh, live at the hollywood bowl of course which is the live show they did and the more recent live show they did uh, you know too i've also kept the live aspen dvd that was originally in the best of box set they did i don't need the best of dvds for series one to four anymore so they've gone but i've kept the live aspen disc that's not really a live show as such it's basically a show that was done in america where they chatted to the pythons although there's a lot of comedy in there as well while they chat to them they do muck around quite a lot and also on that disc is material from python night 1999 which was broadcast on bbc2 to mark the 30th anniversary of monty python so you've got some documentaries and some sketches that were made especially for that so that's been good to see again and i've also watched the documentary almost the truth the lawyer's cut that's a brilliant very comprehensive comprehensive six-part documentary so it's been nice to kind of binge watch everything in my collection monty python is still a classic i still find it wonderfully funny long may python reign as far as i'm concerned i think they are brilliant and will continue to be a huge influence and a huge amount of entertainment for a long time to come and then just to quickly mention some other things i bought on blu-ray as well i decided to upgrade 40 towers to the new blu-ray edition that's come out it's basically a copy of the remastered dvd just upscaled a bit for blu-ray basically so there's not been a major amount of work going on there really but it's just nice to have it in the latest version but if you're not too bothered about upgrading from the dvd then don't worry about it because all the extras are exactly the same as well they've got audio navigation on the menus too and audio description on the episodes just like they did on the dvd which is great and i've also uh, bought the last season of the big bang theory on blu-ray which completes my collection of those you know i watched that earlier in the year and reviewed it very highly because i thought it was a great way to end the show so you know i'll mention the extras when i get round to watching them at a later date i'll just mention them in a later favorites video but i've also bought dad's army the lost episodes that were made by gold and broadcast earlier this year the bbc had wiped many of the episodes and there are three that are still missing so gold remade them with a new cast but using the original scripts and they came out very well so 
I've added those to my collection now. I also bought uh, the Rolling Stones, Bridges to Buenos Aires, uh, which is another one of their live concerts. I've got loads of their live shows now, um, but they are great. You know, Mick Jagger is such an incredible performer. It's just well worth getting all their shows if you're a fan of the band. And on DVD, I bought a stand-up show by Tim Vine called Sunset Milk Idiot, which is another of his live shows. I haven't watched it yet, but I will, again will do a review of that at a later date when I've watched it. I know there's a commentary from him on there and some other random extras. And then if you like Tim Vine, he's also got his own YouTube channel as well now where he's uploading one video per week for a year. And it's basically just him doing all sorts of random things or any short videos like, you know, one, two, three minutes at most. But they are quite funny to watch. So if you like Tim Vine, go and subscribe to his channel. I'll link it in the description, obviously. And then I've also been watching various TV comedies over the month as well. So one new show I tried was called The Cockfield, which was on Gold, starring Joe Wilkinson, Diane Morgan, Sue Johnston, Bobby Ball, Nigel Havers, etc. So some quite big names in there. So I thought I'd give it a go because I knew the names. Um, it was actually quite good. You know, I wouldn't buy it on DVD or anything like that, but it was nice. Nice to watch as a one-off. Joe Wilkinson I'm more familiar with from Cat Stars Countdown, you know, where he acts completely inappropriately. So I've never really seen him in a proper kind of acting role like that, but he was actually quite good. And Diane Morgan is better known to many as Philomena Kunk from the Charlie Booker Wipe shows, and she's had spin-off shows from that as well. She's kind of this very stupid character, but very funny because of it. She's actually got a year review coming up, looking back at 2019. So I'm looking forward to that too. But yeah, it was just it was just a nice comedy to watch. It was only three episodes, it was quite easy. And then there have also been new series of Live at the Apollo, Michael McIntyre's Big Show, and Vic and Bob's Big Night Out on BBC4 as well, which has been back for a second series. And then What the Week has been back from its mid-season hiatus because they always have a break over the summer while the comedians go to the Edinburgh Fringe and do other tour shows and things. And then there have been all the other usual things I've been watching, like The Last Leg and so on, of course. And then the other update to mention is on Taskmaster. Last month I said it might be moving to Channel 4. It indeed is. Uh, the rumours were true. Channel 4 have now taken Taskmaster and they've got a nice deal with them. So we're going to get a good few years worth of Taskmaster still. And Alex Horn has promised that the show isn't going to change. So I hope they live up to that promise. Hopefully Channel 4 aren't going to start trying to put like reality TV stars in it and things like that. We just wanted to keep it as it is, basically. I'm sure there might be one or two changes to it, but hopefully it will stay true to the original format. I know the BBC were bidding for it as well, so there's clearly an acknowledgement that it is a very popular show now. And then just to very quickly mention some new music that came out this month that I bought... Uh, Jeff Lynne's ELO released a new album called From Out of Nowhere, which is brilliant as usual. If you know Jeff Lynne and ELO and you're a fan of theirs, then you know what you're getting into. It's brilliant, as always. And Madness released a new song, which quite literally came from out of nowhere as well, in fact, because nobody was expecting it, I don't think. And that's called Bullington Boys. It's kind of poking fun at the establishment. So that's quite good fun. And there's one or two other things I've bought in December as well that I can tell you about next month. And that's it. That's all I have to mention for November. That was a very detailed post, so... I hope you enjoyed my ramblings through all of that. The next favourites post I do will be my Christmas favourites, of course, where I talk about the things I've been going out and doing, the things I've been watching, the things that you know I've been eating even. Um, there's one or two other things as well I can mention for December that are kind of festive related, but it'll mainly be kind of Christmas themed. I may do a video between Christmas and New Year before I do my festive favourites. There's one or two things I've got in mind, one in particular that I want to try and get out of the way if I can, but we'll see. We'll see what sort of time I have and... You know, things like that. So I'm not going to promise anything, but I've got one or two things in mind I want to either do blog posts about or videos for. But between now and Christmas, you certainly won't get another post from me. So let me take this opportunity to wish you a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. I hope you enjoy yourself, you know, whatever you're getting up to and whoever you're spending the time with. And if things aren't so good for you right now, then you have my sympathies and I hope you're able to relax and recharge, ready to start afresh in the new year. If you're worried about being lonely, then please reach out to friends, family, support organisations that are out there. Social media, there's support as well, like Sarah Millican, for instance, always does an event on Christmas Day on Twitter where people connect using a hashtag. So, you know, if people are feeling lonely, that's a great way for them to kind of pass the time. So there is help out there. Please seek it out. But however you spend Christmas, I hope it's happy. I hope it's comfortable. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to my channel as well. You know, if you subscribe, then you'll see when I release any new videos. But yeah, until I see you either for a kind of mid-Christmas video or my festive favourites of the new year, I hope you have a wonderful time, enjoy the festivities, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye for now. Merry Christmas.